So for those watching this video for the first time, welcome. We're going to review the JBL SDP55 16-channel processor. I'm going to go through a lot of demo scenes. I'm going to talk about some positives, some negatives. There are a lot of things that are going to change with time. I've done a number of videos before this about all the setup and the tuning and showing a lot of the bugs and everything like that. So if you're thinking about getting this, I do encourage you to watch those because they're going to give you a lot of insight about what you're going to encounter. But this video is going to be my final thoughts after using it to watch countless movies and listen to countless two-channel audio songs. So first of all, big thank you to Zach, who gave me the great deal on this. He and his partner, Aaron, are agents of the Screening Room AV, and they are dealers for not only JBL, but a whole bunch of other very popular brands. I'll put his contact info down in the description. Just shoot him an email, and he will work his deal magic. Do not be scared about the MSRP of AV gear that you see. It's, trust me, a lot of BS. You pay a lot less than what you think for all this kinds of gear. But he gave me a great deal, great contact, fast shipping from Harman Direct, so no complaints whatsoever. Let's review this puppy. We're already fully tuned, got Harmony all integrated. It wasn't as bad as I thought. All I did is delete the old receiver, the old Yamaha, out of my activities. It kept everything in there. It kept the integration with the smart home devices and the TV and the source material, um, the fans, the amp, all that kind of good stuff. And it just said, hey, you're missing a, I think they called it a volume control device, you know, the, the receiver. So I added the JBL and it didn't work. And that's because even though the, the codes are in there, everything is fully featured and supported. Works great. You have to go in after you add the, 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 the after you add it as a device. Say that five times fast. You have to go into power settings and tell it that it uses one power button, which isn't anything unusual. However, you have to create a custom sequence for the on and off function. And that's because the JBL remote is a kind of universal remote and it control a whole it controls a whole bunch of different devices the power button does different things depending on what first button you hit so in order to control the device directly from the routines and in, in harmony you have to tell it to hit amp then the power toggle button for both on and off and i just did the the lowest amount a half second worked perfectly so on the docket right now, I'm going to run through a whole bunch of different calibrations. I'm gonna do a reclined sweet spot single seat and just see if it's worth taking up a slot. I wish JBL would give us more slots. Other manufacturers using Direct Live, uh, I see them with five, six or more slots, but we're limited to three. So you kind of have to narrow it down. The one I definitely know I want and I'm going to be using is the wide using the 17 positions and i'm going to do it over the middle three seats and that's simply going to be for when i have family over when i have friends over and they're packed right i definitely want to spread it out for those kinds of viewing nights no problem that i'm not getting the best possible experience in the center seat or whoever's in the center seat it's usually not me when people are over in fact it's never me when people are over anyway for a group setting, I definitely want the best overall experience. And you can, of course, change it whenever you need to between any of those three. Now, here's a big suggestion for JBL in their next firmware, or if they create an app or something, please give us a global way to change that per inputs, or maybe select which inputs and give us a preset Heck, give us presets, period. Unless I'm totally missing something, this is a feature that almost every low-end receiver, high-end receiver, pretty much any theater-type device, even TVs that control different devices have, and that's presets. I mean, you look on a 299 Universal Remote from Walmart, it's got the preset buttons, the, the orange, green, blue, and red buttons. Those are preset buttons on most remotes, and it's for either creating a macro or 
a saved set of parameters. For example, I would have one preset where it's on the shield input and it's using the single seat ah. calibration. Right. You know, everything's set up for that one particular type of viewing situation. And then another preset with maybe the Apple TV for when the wife is streaming with, you know, maybe a wide, I don't know, whatever. Presets allow you one button, everything saved and set up. And I use that in all my commands on the Yamaha. So when I said, you know who, turn on the TV, it would turn on the Apple TV, you know, set everything up, turn on the stereo, it would have another, and all that was doing is triggering one button. The preset I commanded and saved for each of those scenarios. So it wasn't doing anything with the inputs, it wasn't doing anything with different calibrations, it was just hitting one button. That was it, that was the command that did it all, and the receiver did that. They could so easily do that, and they really need to. Obviously, the remote doesn't have the buttons for it, and they're not going to send out new remotes to everybody. Maybe make it an optional purchase, or, you know what, just program it in, and Harmony will update their codes for it. So then we can at least use the presets, just give us the function on, on the back end in the firmware, and that's all we need. Anyway, I'm going to get measuring. It's going to be a while. So first results are in. I did the single seat reclined and kind of as expected, I had about the same difference as I did with YPOW. Everything was still there. Everything was still very similar. I mean, there wasn't anything major that stood out. And really, it's just moving your head basically a foot in space. So you shouldn't really expect anything major. Definitely, at least in my room in this situation, not nearly enough to notice or care about to take up a preset. So I'm just skipping that. The one I'm running now was done in the seated position. Perfect for seated and 99% perfect for reclined. So gold in there just with the one. Yay. Now, one thing before I go through all the clips that's very important. Some of what I'm going to describe is apparent for every seat in the room. It's just the nature of the system and the way it's changing the sound as it is nothing to do with where you are. Some of it, however, is only applicable, especially the more nuanced effects that I'm gonna describe in the primary seat where you did your first measurement. So in my case, that's the center seat. The other important thing, it does make a big difference, not so much in movies, but definitely in two channel, if your head is nearby something. You see my headrest here, my ears are not back up against it. I'm just sitting up normally in the seat like this. Tuscany Valencia, by the way, very comfortable for sitting up, especially with the lumbar. I'll put a link down below. You can save a hundred bucks. But if I sit back like this, because I have this boundary, this reflective surface right here, it dramatically affects the 3D bubble. If I recline, much less of an effect because it's more on a slope and my ears have a clearer path back to the wall. It's about a 50% reduction of the very apparent effects, but the very best way is to just sit up in the seat, leave yourself a gap, exactly like you would place the microphone. That's where you want your ears. That's what you wanna do for best possible results. Okay, let's try this again. YouTube basically dinged me for like 20 clips, even showing a little bit on a TV. Anyway, I'm just gonna have to talk about it. So I'm gonna go through these pretty quick because they're just specific things and specific scenes. 1917, where he's waking up after being knocked out and he's in the city at night. The dynamics of this system are incredible. Not only is the noise floor lower, I mean, I never had any hiss or anything like that of the speakers, but the difference between subtle sounds and sharp loud sounds is noticeably better. And I had always thought that that had more to do with the speakers than anything else. Because I have had speakers. I, for example, Clips 8000s. I had those in here, and they were definitely more dynamic on their own than these Polk LSIM 707s, without a doubt. Especially things like Gunfire. That was definitely more dynamic on the Klipsch. However, this processor made just as big of a difference. I can't imagine if it would be any more going through a more dynamic speaker. I think it just might be able to play the full potential, but I'll tell you what, it is a dramatic 
difference. And it sounds just like a very dynamic speaker once again. So he's waking up, he taps his watch to make sure it's working, right? It sounds absolutely real. That little quick crack, the noise floor in the system and the scene is so low. And just that tink, tink, it's, it just grabs you. So the next thing you want to pay attention to is when he's walking outside and the flares start shooting up. Now I had always had good sound and I heard that the flare was up in the sky, right? In the scene now, it is tangible. You can look up and pinpoint just like this, that the flare is moving and arching over your head. Just like that. I mean pinpoint. Pinpoint realism. Then he's walking through the arch and he sees the building on fire. As the camera comes through the arch and the arch comes forward like this, the roar of the fire just envelops you and you're in the sound field as if you're in his head and the camera pans through his head like this. You feel the roar of the fire all around you and the echo is bouncing off the buildings, just 3D all the way around you. And then he sees a soldier that starts firing at him real quick. Those, those firing shots were always plain as day, of course. But now you hear the ricochet and the reverb and echo off the ricochets all behind you, left, right, swooping around. Wherever that thing shot, you can turn your head and just see it. Really amazing stuff. I'm going to try it this way and hope I don't get dinged again. <laughs> okay, baby driver. Here's another effect that I had. I never knew this could happen. I, I've never heard this before. I'm sure there's other movies and other scenes that do it. I haven't run into it yet. But this one is so far pretty unique. So in this scene, it's near the opening. He's the getaway driver. He's sitting in his car. Everyone else just went into the bank. And he's just jamming out. He's got his headphones in or uh, AirPods in. And he's waiting for them to come out. Right? So he's just jamming out to this song. But... The movie, you can hear everything else going on. You can hear them kind of fighting in the bank and some muffled shotgun shots. Here's the freaky part. And trust me, this has never happened to me before. Before, in this scene, it was banging. I mean, this is like one of the best movies out there for soundtrack. Just the music used. It is so much fun and well recorded. I mean, great channel separation, great stereo image, all that kind of good stuff. Before, all the channels were used. Yeah, I could tell a little bit of Atmos was going on, but not that much. And truthfully, I'm not hearing much actual height information in this either. But it's being used, and it's being weird. It's being used in a weird way. I feel like I'm him. It is somehow controlling using the height speakers and the surround speakers the height of the sound that he's listening to, he's listening to a song, and it's like I have headphones on. It is just like there are two speakers, two headphones, right next to my head, but other stuff in the scene is way outside. It's way wide. It's going way 90 degrees to my left, to my right, behind me. There was a cop car that ran here. That was way off into the kitchen. Yet what he's listening to is right on the sides of my ears. It is free, and it's down low. It's not up high. It's not coming. It doesn't sound like it's coming from up top. It sounds like I have a pair of headphones on. Open back, but still, absolutely amazing. If I, I can't describe it any better than that. This is the opening bombing run scene of Unbroken. Some things to note here. Uh, again, just incredible immersion into the scene itself some things that stand out before the shit hits the fan they're kind of panning around to each gunner position they're just looking at the characters there's an a side gunner just behind the right wing and the camera just kind of does a pan like this and he's looking out into the horizon the sound of the engine that's behind you on the actual wing not only pans behind you with the camera but it gets closer because the camera's doing one of those tracking shots. It sounds like the engine is in the room with you. Another thing, when they're going uh, just before everything starts, they're, they're again going from person to person, and it's a camera looking into the plane, like into the cockpit, from outside the cockpit, just different angles. 
the immersion effect changes completely with each cut. It's like you're absolutely in with that person where they are in the plane and it just subtly changes but the sound field shifts greatly with each person. And then the other thing is the flak itself. It is pinpoint precision. You can hear that one hits right here, two feet above your head to the left, then another one five feet above you to the right up here, a couple behind your head. I have never in my life seen actual movies with this kind of pinpoint precision in space. The only other time I've seen that, and Wipeout did it kind of, but only with some of the Atmos demo disc material. Especially that one where the, the lights are going around, do, 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 vroom, vroom, that kind of thing. I can't remember the name of it, but that gave you the pinpoint over your head kind of immersion, but it never, came up and down and it never placed things in the room like in front of you like this and this system is doing it this is the club fight scene in the second tron what stands out in this is the bass now of course the entire movie is a fantastic daft punk soundtrack however this scene stands out especially at certain moments like when flynn comes in does the superhero landing kind of you know, does his thing on the floor. The bass in this is transformed and it's got to be the impulse control. I'll show you guys later. That's that's the beauty of this. I'm able to actually visually show you what I'm hearing in some of this at least. So the bass is in distinctive layers. It is completely omnipresent. It's very much like you're standing outside of a building that has heavy bass and you know it's just penetrating. You feel it, but the volume level is low. It's very concussive, but again, volume level is low. That's really weird. I've never had that before. To get the concussiveness, it's always had to be louder. I heard the tones before, but I never felt it at this low level. That's a big change. But the layers, you have got, you've got the actual bass of the, the music that, you know, the DJs are playing in the club during the fight. And then you have the effects of somebody being hit and the, the rods are hitting them and, and the concussiveness from that. That's on top of it. And it's in a different space. The music is just all around you. Like it's uh, almost around the perimeter of the room. And the effects are more inside the room with you. It's, it's quite distinctive. But what's really amazing is how you feel the low volume. Never had that before. This is the Dark Knight armored car chase scene. Not only a great scene for audio, but video as well. Fantastic HDR, especially at the beginning when they pass the fire truck. That is just a standout. And of course, it's in IMAX format here, so you get a, a screen filling experience. Some things that stand out with the audio, though. Again, the immersion. The one thing that is dramatically new that I never picked up before. And this is gonna come down to some details. Most of the scene is about the same, but what I'm picking up on are a lot of little things. One is the natural reverb in the scene. When cars are driving under the tunnel, they're in the, uh, whatever it is, it's not a tunnel, under the bridge, right? So you've got tons of concrete all around. When cars are hitting, when guns are shooting, you can actually hear the reverb of the scene in your room and that never came through before it's subtle but it's so obviously clear now another when they first start attacking the truck and the joker has i don't know what it is like an automatic pistol like like a mini uzi or something it was, and then it shows the inside and it's peppering the truck like this you not only hear it i always heard it before of course but it was just you know coming from the rear now it's actually up and down behind you. You can hear vertically where each one of those little things hit right behind your head across the backstage in space. It's clear as a bell. I mean, you can hear that one's high, that one's low, that one's high, that one's low. It's like really amazing stuff. The other thing that note came uh, that's of note is the tumbler itself it should be called the rumbler. So it's got obviously a ton of bass effect to it. The first scene when it appears and then it does the J turn 
and then it takes off again. It was always, you know, just a kind of a rumble effect. Well, it's not actually like a growl. It is a fast series of thumps and it never came through before. It's just like, there's just slight spaces in between the bass and it's like you can hear the tread of the tires as it's taking off. It's it's not grrr. It's again, subtle, but clear as a bell now. And that has to be the impulse control. The Tron light cycle scene doesn't have any crazy effects that are unusual, but it does stand out in that you forget that you're kind of watching a movie. This is what stands out here. All the effects blend absolutely seamlessly into the action. What you see on screen is 100% mapped to the audio. And it really lends you to get into the movie, into the scene, because nothing is really standing out. When a light cycle goes over and makes a jump, the audio's right over there. I mean, it's just like it's really there. When a bike passes on the left or the right, it's 3D through the room. When a, when a little disc hits a guy's head and the stuff sparkles and hits the floor, it's, it's spreading out over there. You don't notice it until you think about it. And you're like, wow. I mean, that's just, you, you expect to hear what you're seeing and you do. Ready Player One, tons, tons of iconic scenes in this. This one is where the big bomb goes off, right? Now, before, sounded awesome. There aren't too many great Atmos effects in this part. I mean, a little bit of coin, you know, around you, but that's about it. What stands out in this is the bass, as far as the difference between before and after. It always had tremendous bass, you know, sounds great. This is this roaring explosion and shockwave hitting everybody, splitting them into coins and that kind of thing, right? But I never heard all the individual details and sounds of each person as this thing is rumbling and they're screaming and they're going, ah, wah, 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 wah. every single one of those little sounds comes through clear as a bell. Before, the bass would, I don't want to say it was muddy. I mean, these are huge sealed subs. Nothing about it was muddy, but it wasn't separate. The bass was just overpowering everything, even though the level is identical. It, I don't have this dialed up one bit more than the other. Sounds the same as far as the impact and the overall volume of everything and the balance. But it's just, again, like a completely separate layer. The bass is omnipresent and it's rolling and everything else is just seamless. The other big difference, and this is, this is for every clip, with the YPOW calibration, center image was very distinctive. It was pinpoint. But a lot of time you got the distinct impression that you were listening to a center speaker. Like you knew it was there. This is much more transparent. And this is for virtually any scene you're watching. You kind of forget that there is a physical speaker there. It varies a lot more where things are centered. Before, everything was just dead center. Really didn't move that much. You, you heard effects if they were distinctively panned left and right, but for the most part, everything was locked nice and center. And this, I mean, you can have a scene with two people talking and literally it sounds like they're standing a foot apart. You can, you can look and you can hear that one person is here and one person is there. And before, both were here. It's that easy to tell. And then, of course, probably the number one demo scene of certainly the movie and certainly most people's demo list, the New York race scene, just filled with absolutely everything. You've got awesome HDR. You've got awesome Atmos effect. You've got awesome details and dynamics. Everything everything is packed in the scene. And I talked about this in previous videos, but what really stands out is the 3D bubble, especially in the two parts of the scene where the coins 
have spilled out and the DeLorean opens the door and they suck the coins up. They are spreading across the room right in front of you. They're here on the table. They are bouncing, they are swirling. You can almost reach out and grab them. They are in front of you. They are not just in the scene. They are not in a wall of sound. It is convincingly three-dimensional audio. Just an absolute showstopper. And I've never heard that before. Not even close. I was hoping I was getting it. And with Dirac off, I only got it the second part of the scene, not the first. Dirac on, both of them do it, and the second one is even better. It's absolutely amazing. The attack on the carrier fleet of Midway is just a Atmos treat. I mean, effects are all around you. It's not only atmospheric. You hear the flak, you hear the planes, you hear the bullets. It's nonstop. You've got incredible bass, especially when the bombs miss and then when they hit. I mean, you've got everything, again, in one scene. Not so great visually. There's a lot of added green to it, so it you know gives it that vintage look. But here's one thing that really stands out, and it's something that uh, I'll talk about after the clips here. This has some very low dialogue levels through the center speaker. Very low. And if you have to turn up your center speaker, I had to do that before. I'll talk about it later on, but I had to turn up my center to hear things super clear. And this was the first scene that made me realize I didn't have to do that. The, I'm serious, the dialogue is several dBs lower than you would expect. The effects, the planes and everything are really loud. And then you hear the pilot talking to the tail gunner. And unless you've turned that up before, you couldn't understand what they're saying. It wasn't muffled or anything, it just wasn't clear and it wasn't loud. But this is coming through at a low dialogue level, clear as a bell. However, I do have to say that sitting in the wings, Two seats over on either side, I can't understand it. It's only sitting in these center seats where it's coming through. So I'm not sure if it's just this room or effect that Drac is having, but in the center, in the good seats, it just brings out those low level details like nobody's business. Funny story about Interstellar. I saw this first in the studio, um, not the studio, in the theater with my parents and my wife and my brother. We were out in Arizona visiting them for a Thanksgiving years ago. And the center channel in the theater wasn't working. So you could not understand a freaking word anybody said throughout the, me throughout the movie. And if you've seen this, you know that it's filled with Zimmer music and it is just overwhelming. So we suffered through that whole movie. I, I remember going back and complaining and they never did fix it. I can't remember if they gave us a refund or what, but it was a horrible, horrible experience. So I never thought about the movie again until it came out later. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I'll give it a rerun here at home. And sure enough, it's a great movie. But in this scene, in the whole docking sequence scene, it is all about dynamics. It is just, number one, loud. It is music loud, it is effects loud, it is concussive loud, you have things banging and exploding and shaking and it is just non-freaking-stop noise. And what stands out compared to the old system is the separation of every single sound. It's very much like an IMAX actual theater. IMAX does some very special things with recording their audio, especially in the documentaries. And they'll say, for example, they'll be in a factory, you know, where it's building a space shuttle part or something. And they'll have effects coming from all the different channels. And they're very distinctive to kind of give you that sound of being there, like a rivet gun or somebody hitting a pipe or you know, something. That's exactly what comes through in here. You get these effects and sounds so clear and distinctive and lifelike. And I have to say, you have to have some great full range surround speakers because the timbre has to match. Number one, your mains, but it has to be near full range. And when that happens, man, it is convincing. This is the kind of scene where stuff happens and you're like, did something just fall in the kitchen? That kind of thing. 
just incredibly dynamic and crystal clear the whole way through. Now, just like Interstellar, Gladiator doesn't have any Atmos, doesn't have any DTSX, just good old DTS MA. And I'll tell you what, I have never heard better movies than those that are mastered in DTS MA for the actual surround. They are flawless. In fact, one of the most impressive to this date. Oh God, what's the name? It's the Mr. Rogers movie. It's in DTS MA. I swear there are so many surround effects in there that have me looking around the house to see if real noises are happening. And it's just so convincing. It's not even funny. This is very much like that. The surround effects 100% circle around your head. Again, no height, doesn't need it. The crowd effects, the tigers, when they come out, they are just so seamless throughout the scene. Sometimes it's kind of jumpy, not, not in this. Sometimes on other systems, even the old one, you'd hear a tiger come out and then it would immediately jump to the center. You know, there, there's not a great transition. This is just realistic panning always and the sound stage goes 90 degrees to the left and the speakers are completely out of the picture here they're they you don't know anywhere where they are in the room you could if it was pitch black in here you wouldn't know if the speaker's here here or here you'd have no idea it's just like a great near field setup just seamless surround all the way around that's what stands out here all right so i've got a ton more scenes but I'm going through them all. And I'm just trying to pick something unique that you guys can pick out. And I'm starting to repeat myself. So uh, I'm going to stop here. And now I'm going to show you why this thing is really cool. Now, I am probably going to keep tweaking because there's still some stuff I have to learn about the intricacies of Dirac and, you know, tweaking every little last thing I can get out of it. But, man, I am super happy with it right now. So what I did is... The left and right subs, I measured them independently because they're controlled completely independently. I wanted to see what they were doing. This is the left sub with no room correction. As you can see, these subs are incredible. They're nice and flat as, you know, right out of the box. This is with no EQ, no Dirac, anything. This is just out of the box. And then this is with room correction, even flatter especially through the crossover. My crossover is set to 90 right now. And there's just a gentle slope. It actually goes from about 60 to about 120. That's what the Harman 6 curve does. And I'm going to play with that too. You know, I'm, I'm still adjusting and seeing what I like. Very different from what I had done before, which was from 20 to uh, 90 or 100, somewhere around there, in a straight line down. The Harman curve is way up higher and it gives you just basically a flatter plateau of sub bass and you know what i like that a lot better so that's definitely something i'm gonna keep enjoying but here's the killer and i'll show you the right one here here's the right one out of the box and corrected i mean that's just a dramatic difference right there here's the cool thing though let's take a look at the left this is called a waterfall display. This is a representation of how much ringing, how much, think of it as echo or reverb in the room is happening from the sub. So when the sub plays, it's putting out a clean signal. You know, it's just putting out sound. When it interacts with the room, all these areas here are extra sound that isn't supposed to be there. The line here is the same as the regular frequency response, okay? Think of it as a, the back of the wall that you're looking at here. And as it extends forward at these frequencies, as you can see this more material here coming forward, it's ringing, it's continuing to produce noise past when it should in these areas. Ideally, you want this to be, you don't want any of this. You want this nice and flat, like a vertical wall. And look what Dirac does. Totally different. See how this is just like a sheer wall here? I mean, there's still some. It's not a perfect room. It's never going to be perfect. But this difference is huge to your ears. Here's before and after. I mean, not only did it flatten out the frequency response some, but 
This is what makes all the difference. And this is the impulse response that Direct does and the incredible phase control. Here's the right out of the box and then controlled. That is why the base quality is so much better. So I hope this has helped you at least get some more information to maybe make a decision whether or not you upgrade to this or something else in the future or you know something else with direct maybe you just want to play with it or maybe you just want to go separates and you want some of the benefits but not all the benefits at a lower price whatever just know that there are significant steps of quality and difference in sound both in stereo and multi-channel out there for you to explore if you're like me and you were just playing around with receivers up until now the quality is out there if you want to experience it. And the cool thing about Dirac is it's made for bad rooms. That's why I was so interested in Dirac. Some of its major features are to correct bad rooms. Yay, it works. You guys know if you've watched me for years, I don't BS. I have no reason to make stuff up or exaggerate. I'm not in the business. I'm not selling anything. I'm just giving you my flat out experience. Now, I know the irony in that because I'm not one to just believe someone's talking points. You know what I mean? That's why I think these graphs can really help drive home to some people, at least. That's what I'm hearing, and that's what you get out of this JBL SDP 55. That's it, guys. More videos to come, I'm sure, in the future. If there's something specific you would like me to test or show, let me know, and I'll add it to my list. See you next time.